on to the next topic which is uh, recovery. So, uh, the overview is we are going to first look at what are failures and how does that affect um, recovery, a little bit on storage uh, impact on recovery and uh, then we will focus on atomicity, logging and we will wrap up with something called remote backup system. So, first of all what are the failures that we need to deal with? Recovery has uh, two issues, uh, but the primary issue in recovery is how do you deal with failures of various kinds. So, one kind of failure is transaction failure, meaning uh, there is a logical error, for example, an integrity constraint violation and therefore, you have to roll back the transaction. If you have to roll it back, how do you undo the partial effects of the transaction? So, that is part of recovery. Then there could be system errors. For example, you may have a deadlock which uh, forces the database to roll back some transactions. The recovery uh, issues are similar here. How do you undo the partial effects? Then you might also have a system crash. Um, now, what is a system crash? One kind of system crash is when power fails and the system just shuts down. But there are many other things. You may have had uh, the operating system hang blue screen on windows. Um, what kind of things can go wrong here? Now, in the worst case, uh, something very bad can happen and uh, uh, there is a bug which corrupts the database. These kind of things are very, very hard to recover from if there is serious corruption. You have to essentially take an old backup and recover from that. It is not easy. Uh, the main focus of all the techniques will be, you know, the techniques we look at make what is called the fail stop assumption. That is, non-volatile storage contents are assumed to not be corrupted by system crash. Now, this is an assumption. You cannot prove that it holds, but you can do a lot of stuff to make it happen as far as possible. It is not a 100 percent guarantee, but all database systems and for that matter operating systems and so forth do a lot of things to check internally for corruption. They have checksums on various data structures, they have checksums on pages and so forth. So, if they find a checksum is violated, that means some corruption has happened and at that point, they just stop and run a recovery system, uh, algorithm, a recovery algorithm which we will see. So, the basic idea here is that uh, before something actually results in the disk uh, copy being corrupted the database system will usually block it. This is not a 100 percent guarantee, uh, rare bugs can cause corruption, but it is a tribute to the uh, careful way in which database systems have been written that there are so many applications which depend critically on databases, but very, very rarely have you heard of somebody losing data due to a database uh, crash. They are very, very well written pieces of software typically. Um, all those which we use have been well written and most of them have had some occasional instance of corruption due to a bug, but it is extremely rare. But all of them, all system which we use do have problems where the system crashes and power fails and so on. So, these are the kinds of things which we need to deal with. Now, you can also have a disk failure which actually uh, leads to data loss. We know how to use RAID to minimize that chance, but if in spite of that data loss happens, what do you do? So, then you have to have a backup and you uh, have to recover from the backup. Now, storage structure is divided into three levels now. We already saw volatile and non-volatile. Now, on top of it, we define another thing called stable storage, which is in some sense a mythical form of storage that survives, which is assumed to survive all failures. Practically, that is not possible. Uh, you can have coordinated failures that destroy it. But you can get an approximation of it by using two things. One is RAID, so that if a disk fails, you do not lose data, but RAID by itself is not enough. You may have a fire in your data center which destroys it and both copies of your disk may be gone. So, you need a non-local remote storage as well. So, uh, stable storage needs to have uh, remote backup and so forth. We are going to come back to remote backup in end of this uh, chapter. So, we are going to assume that there is stable storage and we will say write data to stable storage, meaning that once it is written, it will not be lost. That is critical. Now, let us move on to uh, data access. Uh, 
physical data blocks are those data blocks that are resulting uh, residing on disk. In contrast, the buffer block is a block that is temporarily in main memory. So, this is based on the idea that there is a disk buffer. When you want to read a block, the first step is to input the block from disk. By disk, I am including solid state disk, it need not be hard disk. So, you input the block from uh, the disk or the physical location to main memory. So, now it is in the database buffer in memory. And now you can proceed to read from the uh, in memory block right to the in memory block. But the in memory block is copied out to disk when an output B operation happens. The output operation transfers the block B to the disk and overwrites whatever was there on disk earlier. So, input and output are the two operations that affect the disk contents or the stable contents. Uh, reads and writes are assumed to happen in memory. So, this is shown schematically here. Excuse me. This is the buffer and the buffer has um, several blocks, two of them are shown A and B. Input A copies the block from disk into buffer, output B copies the uh, block from buffer to disk. Now, when a transaction wants to read or write uh, a, a tuples x or y, uh, the first step in order to read x is to find which block it resides in input it if it is not already resident and then return it. Similarly, when transaction wants to write y, it is written in the buffer, it is not directly written to disk at this point. The write to disk happens only when the output operation happens. So, essentially writes could be done in local memory of the transaction, it could also be done on the buffer, but until the output happens, the disk copy is not updated. I hope that is clear. Input output affect disk, read and write are assumed to be in memory operations. Next, uh, we need to ensure atomicity in spite of various kinds of failure. And the key to ensuring atomicity is to first output information describing the modifications to stable storage. Why, what do you mean by stable storage? I already told you it is assumed to survive crashes of all kinds. Once I have written something to st stable storage, it is safe there. Even if the system crashes, I can get that data back from stable storage. That is the idea. So, we are going to output information about the modification to a log on stable storage before doing the modification on the actual uh, disk copy of the database. And the focus is on what are called log based recovery mechanisms. There are alternatives, there is something called shadow paging, we are not going to cover it here. Uh, the book briefly talks about it. Uh, it is used in non database applications. Your editor typically makes a backup of your file while it, you are editing it. So, if you quit the edit session in the middle, uh, the original file is not affected. So, that is called shadow copying or shadow paging. So, sticking to logging, log based recovery is based on log records, which are stored in a file called a log on disk. Log can have actually multiple files. A log is a sequential structure, so it is a sequence of log records and all updates are basically logs over here. Now, when a transaction starts, it registers itself by writing a TI start log record. And before it does a write x, it writes a log record uh, TI x, which is the identifier of the particular record. And then there are two values which it writes. The V1 is the old value of x and V2 is the old new value of x. Now, when I say x here, it could be a whole tuple or it could even be an attribute of a tuple. It does not necessarily have to update the whole tuple. So, this log record says what is the old value and what is the new value of whatever that part of the tuple is. Uh, this log record is written to the log on stable storage before T executes the write. That is the key idea here. Now, when TI finishes, the last statement of the transaction is a TI commit and this is also written to the log. And the uh, basic idea is that when this uh, commit record goes out to the log, when the commit record is written to the log, uh, then the transaction is safe in that all that updates that it did are now on the log in stable storage. If a failure happens from here on, we have enough information to uh, replay whatever the transaction did and we can tell the user that now you can assume the transaction is committed. So, if the cashier 
you know, wanted to do a transaction, deducting 100 rupees from the bank account, uh, after the log records are written, the cashier can be told, go ahead now, uh, it's committed. And then the cashier hands out 100 rupees to the customer. So now, there are actually two approaches to using logs. One is called deferred database modification. The other is called immediate database modification. In deferred database modification, updates are not done uh, immediately. The updates are done to the database only when, by database I mean even the Quebec here. In deferred update, the updates are kept local to the transaction until the transaction commits. At the time when the transaction requests a commit, the updates are written to the uh, buffer here. On the other hand, in immediate modification, the update can be written to the buffer at any time during the transaction's execution. It does not have to wait for commit. So, uh, those are the two approaches, deferred and immediate. So, here the immediate modification allows updates to be made to the buffer or even to the disk itself, and we will see this later, even before the transaction has committed. And the log record for the update must be written before the database item is written. And at this point, we will assume the log record is output directly to stable storage. Later, we will see how to postpone it for efficiency. The other part is that the order in which blocks are output to the disk can be different from the order in which they are written. And in fact, the output of updated blocks to the stable storage um, on disk basically can take place at any time before or after transaction commit. So, this is important. Um, with, with this technique, with, with logging basically, uh, there is no need to write the update immediately to the database. Why would you postpone it? You, would post, you might postpone it for efficiency. You want to collect multiple updates and write it together. What if there is a crash and it has not yet been written? Well, all the writes have been logged. So, the log has enough information to redo uh, whatever is required such that um, the database state is recovered in case there is a crash. So, you can postpone outputting to the database. That is a key idea. The deferred modification scheme, as I said, uh, defers updates even to the buffer until the transaction commits. And this uh, simplifies some aspects of recovery, but it has an overhead of storing local copies. Um, we will not go further into deferred modification. We will focus on the immediate update. Uh, the next topic is uh, something which I already said, that a transaction is said to have committed when its commit record is output to stable storage. Now, all the log records are written in order. So, when the commit record is written, everything else the transaction did, which has already been logged, is going to be output to log already. And as I said, writes performed by a transaction may still be in the buffer when the transaction commits and may be output much later. Uh, why do this? It reduces number of disk writes to commit a transaction, faster commit. Uh, in particular, if a page is updated many times, because it is not immediately output to disk, the updates of this transaction and the next and the next may all be collected on that page before its output. So, instead of three or five different outputs, it is output only once. So, the number of outputs done actually can decrease. So, efficiency improves. Okay. So, um, I, here is a small example of immediate database modification to illustrate what goes on. T naught starts, log record is written. T naught updates A from 1000 to 950 and it updates B from 2000 to 2050. So, it is transferring 50 from A to B. So, the log records are written and then the write happens. A is assigned 950, B is assigned 2050. So, this write is in the buffer still, it is not yet been output. Then T not commits, T1 starts, T1 updates C from 700 to 600 and it also does a write uh, to the buffer at this point. Now, T1 has not yet committed. At this point, it is possible that the buffer blocks for B and C are output. So, you are seeing two things that a, uh, first of all, T0 has committed, but its updates have not yet been output. B, that T1 has not yet committed, but already its buffer block containing the update to C has been output, even before T1 commits. After this, T1 commits, and maybe after this, uh, the buffer block A uh, is output much after T0 commits. Okay. 
okay. So, this is what immediate database modification allows, but the important thing is the log records already have the writes which T naught did and which T 1 did. So, even if something is not being output it is ok. Conversely here if T 1 does not commit, but a crash happens at this point after the buffer block has been written out a crash happens. So, what has happened is that the disk copy reflects a transaction which did not commit and whatever update was done has to be undone. The good news is that this log record T 1 C 700 600 has enough information to undo it. What is the information? The old value of C that is available. We can use the old value to undo this uh, thing which on the disk copy and that is part of recovery. Okay, I will stop here, but I will take a couple of questions. Uh, Shankaracharya Institute, is good, please go ahead. Sir, I am having a doubt that how shadow copy concept is maintained in uh, distributed systems. Uh, shadow copy with distributed. So, first of all, as I said, shadow copy is not widely used. Uh, initially, when uh, recovery in databases was thought of, uh, people uh, did implement shadow copy scheme. The problem with shadow copy scheme is that it does not work well with concurrent updates to the same thing. So, then people extended it to uh, variant with shadow paging, but even that ran runs into trouble if two transactions update data on the same page. So, uh, the shadow based schemes have been abandoned for high things with higher concurrency. They are still used in uh, you know when you edit a file a shadow copy is made, but then two people are not editing the file at the same time. Furthermore, the file is relatively small, so you can afford to make a copy of a file. You cannot afford to make a copy of large parts of a database. So, it is not widely used and uh, I do not know of anybody who has even worried about how to use it in a distributed setting. Hello sir, is there any graphical uh, or simulation tool to visualize transactions and locking? Good question. Is there a tool to visualize transactions and locking? Uh, I do not know of any tool specifically for this, but in today's lab you are going to be doing exactly this by running transactions concurrently from multiple windows. Okay, so, you will do an update in one window then do something in another window uh, and these all have to be part of the same transaction. So, in PostgreSQL uh, you know you have to do this by a begin statement uh, which ensures that the following statements until rollback or commit are all part of the same transaction. Uh, in other databases you have variants. Uh, so, you are actually going to be seeing this in action. Uh, so, it is not a tool, it is just manually typing things into multiple windows, uh, typing a command in one executing it, typing a command in another executing it and seeing what happens. Uh, sir, one other question, which type of log is maintained by Postgres actually in implementation time? So, how, how does PostgreSQL do concurrency control? Let me rephrase the question that way. As I said PostgreSQL uh, implements a form of snapshot isolation. So, up to PostgreSQL 9.1 this was the snapshot isolation which I briefly talked about. Uh, the basic idea that uh, when a transaction starts it gets a snap logical snapshot is supported by PostgreSQL. Even today PostgreSQL does do snapshot isolation. The only thing is that the checks uh, which are uh, done when a transaction does not update uh, or decides to commit are, are a little different. And these checks ensure serializability. So, this protocol is called serializable snapshot isolation. The core of snapshot isolation which is that reads are done from a snapshot remains unchanged. The only thing is that uh, when a transaction wants to commit the checks are a little different and those checks ensure uh, serializability. So, you will actually be uh, seeing this in action today. You will see that uh, although a transaction uh, committed another transaction which started before it and is still running is seeing data from a snapshot. It is not seeing the latest committed value. You will see that it is reading an old value because of snapshot. So, the snapshot becomes visible uh, through the lab exercises which you will do today. Anna University. Hello, good morning sir. So, I have one question. My question is how GFS differ from HTFS? 
GFS is Google file system, while HDFS is Hadoop file system. So GFS was uh, the first of the modern generation distributed file systems. Now it, distributed file systems have a long history. Um, back in uh, the early 1980s uh, to mid 80s, there was a project at CMU called CODA, which built a distributed file system. And there were others even before. Uh, so they have a long history. Uh, Google files, so they were research tools and some of them were used in practice, but not widely used. Uh, Google file system was the first very widely used distributed file system. And Hadoop file system is essentially a open source clone of Google file system. Not an exact clone, it's not exactly the same, but the basic ideas are the same. Uh, good morning, sir. I am from NRI Institute of Information Science and Technology, Bhopal. Uh, my question is from Servlet session. The question is, sir, why re restarting of web server is necessary every time after changing in Servlet? Okay. The question is, why do you have to restart the web server every time you change the Servlet? Okay. So, uh, if you remember, uh, the Servlet uh, basically gets compiled into a class, and that class is dynamically loaded into the database server. Now, when you make a change, the database server uh, has to uh, replace the current uh, version of the class code with the new version. Now, the question is, how is this done? Uh, so, it has to reload it, and one way to reload it is to restart it. Uh, but, uh, you know, many web servers have, uh, when you use JSP in particular, uh, they have a thing where they automatically detect if something has changed and they reload it. Um, so, uh, if that is available, then you do not have to explicitly restart the web server. Uh, they will check timestamps and reload it whenever anything changes un un underneath. Um, but even in Tomcat, you do not actually have to restart Tomcat. Uh, there is a Tomcat controller, uh, there is a web interface which uh, we did not get into, uh, which allows you to reload just the servlets that you want to. So, uh, even if automatic detection is not there, it is possible to reload just the servlets which you changed. Um, but for simplicity, we did not get into it. But if you want to run a production system, yes, these are useful. You do not want to shut down the system because one servlet changed. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are the mechanisms we can implement in servlet to reduce transaction time in web server and databases? Can it would be possible with stored procedures? The question is, uh, can, what can you do to reduce transaction time and can stored procedures be useful in this? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, so what are the issues here? So if a transaction uh, is, uh, if the servlet is doing a long transaction with multiple accesses to the database, what happens is that every time you access the database, a message is sent across the network, uh, something happens, then a message comes back, and all of this leads to some delays. The delays may not be much, it may be a millisecond or even less than a millisecond, uh, but they add up. So each round trip uh, delay, if it is a millisecond, it adds up over multiple round trips. Uh, so one of the ways of optimizing this is to code all your logic into a stored procedure and then just execute the stored procedure. So now there is no round trip delay and the database can finish the whole transaction maybe in one millisecond. So one round trip and the whole thing is done. So that might be preferable if your uh, servlet is doing multiple steps. So that is one of the ways to optimize uh, uh, web uh, interaction. So it optimizes the database interaction and correspondingly the web in, in, uh, the user also sees a faster response. Yeah, I see somebody is ready with Good morning, sir. My question is from servlet session. Hmm. My question is cookies are stored in client web browser yeah. and with cross server script, attacker can access the client or user cookie. So is, the, is this any safe way to store cookie and can be used by only client not accessible by attackers? Okay. So there is already a security thing built into cookies. Uh, a particular cookie can only be requested by a page from the same uh, website or the domain which created the cookie in the first place. So google.com stores the cookie. Uh, if you do a HTTP interaction with IITB.ac.in, IITB cannot access your cookie. That is the basic safeguard that is built into uh, all web browsers. Uh, 
so the only way to fake it would be for uh, domain to fake itself as google.com and then uh, get the cookie otherwise your browser is not going to give the cookie to somebody else thank you sir yeah team college go ahead please um, my question is can you can you please define phantom problem with respect to oracle or any other commercially avail available databases i mean you said that oracle has defined it in a different way and they claim that it does not exist yeah. ibm did it long time back yeah you have microsoft also yeah. so what is is there any paper definition something of that kind yeah uh, so uh, the phantom phenomenon uh, has uh, been uh, loosely described uh, and um, you know different papers uh, mean slightly different things by it uh, the definition uh, i didn't give you a definition i gave you an example of a phantom where uh, with tuple locking uh, you know you could have a non serializable execution that's not exactly a definition either uh, so the uh, way the phantom phenomenon was described in the sql standard was unfortunately loose um, and uh, they defined it uh, partly uh, in terms of repeatable reads so the way they defined it they assumed you use locking and the idea was that uh, if you, you if you use locking and you run a query which says um, show me all uh, students who have taken cs101 and after some time you again issue the same query uh, and if you did tuple level locking uh, did nothing more then the set of results could change the exact example i gave you if you use tuple level locking uh, i showed you non serializable execution but the same example what it shows is that if t1 says find me all uh, takes tuple level 101 it gets a result if it again reissues the same thing um, find me all things in 101 it sees a different set of results this is what happens with locking so what uh, the sql standard unfortunately did is uh, it said um, that uh, phantom is uh, where a predicate read like this predicate read is one which says find me all tuples that satisfy a predicate if a predicate read is repeatable meaning it will give the same result every time you run it they said the, uh, there is no phantom phenomenon the phantom phenomenon occurs if a predicate read is not repeatable now what what oracle did is it said look i am running off a snapshot in that snapshot i don't even see the updates of other transactions so i will get repeatable predicate reads so the trick was the following the oracle the sql standard unfortunately defined phantoms in terms of repeatable predicate reads and that is not enough because with snapshots you get repeatable predicate reads but the core problem which i showed you of non serializable executions will continue the same problem will occur in oracle whatever i showed you can be executed exactly as is and uh, could well not quite the particular example i showed you depended on um, let me go back to that example so if you can see this on your screen in this particular example t2 did an update which t1 saw uh, it will turn out that with uh, snapshot isolation uh, t1 cannot see that update of t2 uh, because uh, it's reading from its own snapshot so this particular example um, may not cause a violation with snapshot isolation but you can construct other examples which show uh, this problem with even with snapshot isolation and uh, this problem certainly can occur with snapshot isolation uh, with a slightly different example and the core issue is that there is a conflict uh, between a read here and an insert here or, or an update for that matter which is not detected by in the case of locking by tuple level locking in the case of snapshot isolation uh, the uh, write uh, are only checked against writes uh, but not against uh, reads are not cross checked and so there can be many reasons for non serializability with phantom uh, with a variant of phantom being one of the causes uh, that was not a probably a very clear explanation but uh, i hope uh, that gave you some idea of what the phantom problem is thank you professor that was nice i think we'll so one last here uh, for the tea break